we're going on to some more questions about election, and you can see there what we're looking at. The other two questions are uh, about election are the question of human liberty and the question of personal interest. And this question of uh, liberty also has three dimensions to it. Uh, liberty or freedom in terms of human action, and then in terms of human risk, and then in terms of human significance. That's how they've been uh, coming in at us in history. So I'll take those three and unpack them a little bit. First of all, this freedom and human action. So here the question is, doesn't election clash with human freedom? How can an action be free if God, who elected according to his predestined plan, how can election, how can our action be free if God has already predestined whatsoever comes to pass? That's what the Bible teaches. So human freedom and divine sovereignty are in this question allegedly mutually exclusive. Exclusive. You can have one or the other. You can have divine sovereignty in the election. We can have human freedom, but they claim you can't have both. So if sovereign, if God is sovereign, then the allegation is that our freedom is just an illusion. It might seem as if we're acting as we freely wish to, but in reality it's God pulling the strings like a puppet here to accomplish his predestined will. And so God's sovereignty allegedly leaves humans as mere puppets. In other words, this is another version of You've all heard of a philosophy called fatalism. Mm. It's another version of fatalism. God's sovereign decree is, and this is my way of looking at fatalism. A lot of Christians I've come across see God's sovereign decree as like a cosmic bulldozer. You probably all see it going to be Caterpillar D9, and there's bigger ones than that now. But once you put that thing in low range and you push the, you know, the, the joystick, the foot, the foot stick forward, Ain't nothing. No red gum tree is going to stand in front of it. So they see God's predestining, electing purposes as a cosmic bulldozer that just moves through history, mowing down everything that gets in the way of its preset program. But you know, that's just so false. And thankfully, good Christian theology has repeatedly, time after time, rejected that sort of fatalistic view. The Westminster Confession, I think, says it as well as anything ever written in English. Moral creatures are not forced to act against their will, and the free working of secondary causes is not taken away, but rather is established. Secondary causes just means human will, human purpose. God's decree does not force men against their will. It doesn't treat us as insignificant and mere puppets. It doesn't push us relentlessly before it. God's eternal plan does not com compromise our genuine freedom and our human actions, that is, our secondary causes. Now, by nature, you know this is true, we all deny God. And here's my question for you, if this problem is uh, true that we've been discussing now. By nature, right, we all deny God. Do we do it because we're forced to? Do we sin and deny God because we're being driven by this big cosmic bulldozer called God's predestined purpose? No, the sad and tragic thing is we, we do it because we do it freely. We do it because we want to. We go astray freely according to God. We all suppress the truth in what? In bulldozer mode, and no, no, we suppress the truth in our righteousness, in our wickedness, willingly. Why does none of us seek after God, not even one? Is it because we lack the freedom to seek Him? Uh, would we love to be godly, but we just can't because of some eternal decree that won't let us? No. You know the hideous thing about our sin? You might think it can't get any worse. Yes, it can. The hideous thing about our sin is it's willing. We're doing what we will. Our sin is the free expression of our perverse nature. We're not puppets. No one is pulling our strongs, uh, our, our strings, I should say. We sin freely. So what the doctrine of election actually means is 
a godly resource of land ago, God leaves some people to their freedom. He gives them up to themselves to do what they really want to do and to reap their deserved consequences. But God does not do that lightly, does he? God doesn't just leave people to themselves. What does he do? He frequently warns them. How many times did he warn Pharaoh? With pretty graphic warnings, you have to say. He warns them against their sinfulness. He urges them to turn back. There are places in the Bible where you hear God open up at the heart of God. Turn back, turn back. Why will you perish, you sons of Adam? He warns them, he urges them, and he encourages them to trust him because he sends daily supplies of his lavish bread, uh, blessings to them. But men are perverse. They perversely insist on going their own way. And they are determined to serve themselves rather than God. Now, you might be thinking at this stage, but it doesn't the Bible say that human freedom is actually bondage? Well, yes, it does, but be careful not to confuse two things. Don't confuse two different senses of bondage, two different contexts of freedom. There is physical freedom and there is spiritual freedom. Physically, men are all free agents. We are free to do what we want. But spiritually, in the spiritual world, we are not free. We are slaves. We are in bondage to sin. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? But one is the physical sense of freedom, the other is the spiritual sense of freedom. Our problem, as we saw, is we are enslaved to ourselves until God sends saving grace to us. We're enslaved to ourselves and to our own godless nature. And even this cannot be taken in a fatalistic sense because those men who remain fallen creatures and slaves themselves, they're very willing. So much so that if you tell one of them you are a slave to sin, have you got your boxing gloves on? Mm -hmm. Remember how Jesus proved this very point when he said in John chapter 8, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. If the sun sets you free, you will be free and be. And then they vehemently rejected this, you remember. And they grew more determined to kill Jesus. You are ready to kill me, he said. Because you have no room for my word. No room. So, my dear friends, this is the context for the doctrine of election. All the moral elect are just like that. God leaves them to their freedom. He leaves them to their free choice of spiritual bondage. A bondage they refuse to admit. They do not want God interfering in their lives. We will not, what has a New Testament put it, we will not have this man to reign over us. They ignore his warnings, they scoff at his sincere invitations. In no sense does the doctrine of election contradict their freedom. But what about the others then, the elect? Well, I hope you find this quite encouraging. It's ironical in a sense, but it's encouraging. The glorious truth is that God increases the freedom of his elect people. You know how he does it? It's ironical. He increases our freedom by moving, by ending our freedom to disobey. Just work on that. He increased my freedom as one of his chosen people by taking away from me my freedom to disobey, otherwise I'd still be disobeying. Now he gave me a new heart, a new will, a new inclination, a new spirit, and a freedom and ability to believe the gospel. So whatever side you come from, no one loses their freedom because of the doctrine of election. So what's the end result of election? Well, the end result of election by the predestination of Philip Ryder. Predestination means that God rules and overrules all the free events of free men. So that what he wants at the end will happen. That's what predestination means. All the outcomes are certain to him. Predestination, let me repeat this because it's so critical. Predestination means all the outcomes of all the events in all of history are certain to God. But have a guess who they're not certain to. They're not certain to us. To say that everything I will do tomorrow is predestined or if you like decree means it's certain to God. There are no contingencies for God. There are no uncertainties for God. There are no mere possibilities for God. Just absolute certainties. But we don't know what we'll be doing tomorrow. We don't even know if we're going to have it tomorrow, do we? 
But whatever we do tomorrow, we will do it as free agents. I will do what I will do. That's true for every human. There is no fatalistic pressure upon me. I will do. There's no cosmic bulldozer forcing me to behave against my will. I'm not living life thinking, oh, I'm getting mowed down by this cosmic predestined bulldozer. I don't know what be here, but it's, it's pushing me. That is the infantile mentality behind this question against election. Let me take up a second version of this one. Freedom and human risk. This question about liberty or freedom is often asked in terms of the risk involved. And I'll, I'll rephrase the question, but this is how it's been asked. Well, why didn't God make sin impossible? Why did he make Adam a free agent who was capable of obeying or disobeying? Why didn't he make Adam um, incapable of disobeying? Why not rule out the risk of disobedience? Then there'd be no need for the doctrine of election and all our associated questions. There'd be no. Jacob and Esau would both be equally godly and happy with God. Why didn't God prevent sin in his eternal plan? And so you notice how this question is going. This question is ignoring the distinction between what theologians call the root creation and the moral creation. But this word root is not a derogatory term, it's, a, it's actually its true theological meaning. It, mean, it refers to those creatures that don't live in the moral world. We, you and I, angels and men, live in the moral world. But the root creation refers to that part of creation where they don't exercise choices to serve God or to rebel against Him without knowing that these creatures just do God's will. Not because they choose to, because that's how they're made. The most obvious examples of the brute creation are things like the sun, the moon, the stars, lightning, rivers, clouds, hills, wind, snow, tides, rocks, mountains, plants and animals and you can make that list as long as you like. These creatures, these brute creatures, they don't commit sin because they don't decide to do what they do or not decide to do something else. They cannot. They're just made to do what they do. But men and angels, as I say, are very different. We belong to what is called the moral realm, the moral creation, where we consciously and willfully choose to obey or to transgress. And as you know how the Genesis account goes, God made Adam and Eve good. He made them innocent. With the freedom to either confirm that, in which case they'd become righteous, or lose that, in which case they would choose unrighteousness, and you know which way they went. But the choice lay in their hands because they are not part of root creation, they are part of a moral creation of God. They're not programmed machines. If you remove choice, then you remove their moral nature. Now, I hope that they'll all agree on this next statement. The glory, the true glory that God seeks, God seeks glory not slavish obedience. He already has that. The sun and the moon and the stars give, if you want to use the word slavish, yeah, they do exactly what God says. They don't choose to do it. God is not after that sort of worship or service. He's already got that. What God wants and what God deserves is the service of free rational creatures who love Him because they want to. Hence the doctrine of election. So the question of risk is really quite a futile question, isn't it? It doesn't face reality of the real world, the real cosmos. Instead of addressing the real cosmos, it's in dreamland postulating what about there's a sinless hour. And so, in my opinion, it's all sheer fantasy. The world is not like that, never was like that. It's just sheer fantasy. Life would go and read Ian Whiten and the fairy stories. If ever there was a pointless question, this particular question is it. So I don't want to spend any more time on it, but I come to the, the next aspect of freedom which is often raised, and that is freedom and human significance. And this is how the question goes. What is the point of evangelizing the world if God has already decreed, i.e. elected the results? If the elect will be saved, come on now, and the rest will be lost, do whatever they will, what does it matter whether we do or don't preach the gospel? What's the point of missions? 
if the result is already totally fixed in God's plan, that's how the question comes up in history. What's the point of anything if predestination is true? Well, no matter how you word this question, it assumes that election removes all significance from human action. It allegedly removes motivation and zeal for evangelism. It, it, it assumes that a, a definite predestined result makes everything we do quite irrelevant. Because what's going to happen is going to happen anyway, because God's already predestined it. That's how the question goes. If this world is going exactly where God has eternal purpose to go, well, who am I? I'm not significant, I don't. What can I do? Nothing. And how can I make any difference to anything? You see the question? Well, let me show you how futile the question is by let's rent the underlying request, the underlying assumption. Let's get rid of a doctrine of predestination and election. Let's assume God is not sovereign. Let's assume God does not rule and overrule all things. Let's get rid of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, which remember says that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Let's say that's not true. Let's assume that the cosmos is completely random, that everything just happens without any rhyme or reason behind it, that nothing is heading anywhere in particular as predestination as it is, that there's no real goal or purpose decreed by God. So let's get rid of Ephesians 1.10 as well, which says uh, that, 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 that God's grand scheme, he's moving this whole cosmos to this end, namely an administration, <coughs> which I'll put this text up for you, here it is. Hang with me, I'll come up with the, uh, up with the text. In that case, no, I've gone too far, folks, just bear with me. I'm feeling the heat too. I might have had it up, I don't know. Yeah, so we're getting rid of Ephesians 10. In that case, would you not agree if that's the way that we're going to reason? There's no, there's no point in anything. Who cares what you believe or hope or pray if this world was just random? Who cares? It leads nowhere, so who cares? Who cares whether or not you try to convert your next door neighbour or somebody else to some religious thing you call gospel or good news? Who cares? I think the answer is given in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it repeatedly says it many, many times over, vanity, vanity, all is vanity under the sun. Under, under the sun is on the Hebrew expression, which means excluding God, keep God out of it for a minute. Under the sun, if that's all there is to it, if there's no sovereign God, it's just a waste of time. Life is just dead set, a waste of time. That's exactly what the book of Ecclesiastes is teaching. Everything is meaningless. If this mundane world is all there is. But let me tell you, friends, this is where we stand as Christians. We know there is a sovereign God, we know he's wonderful. And it's precisely because there is this wonderful God in complete control of everything in this universe, and he's bringing it to his chosen end. Precisely, precisely because of that, then human actions are very significant. It makes sense to evangelize the world precisely why? Because God has chosen a multitude to be saved. That's why it's, it makes sense. His decree to save these people guarantees success of Christian missions, doesn't it? If there was no sovereign God who chose people, what's the point of putting their guns out? They're not going to believe. And it motivates evangelism. So, I hope you can see that that's, it gives, the doctrine of election gives a rational basis for our true human effort. And by the way, I'm going to say to you, don't, don't be um, fooled by the often prejudicial ways of wording this question about God's sovereignty. I, I said it once, but I'll put it back up for you. A lot of times you'll see people putting it this way. Oh, they say, all right, you, you people who believe in sovereignty, you say that the elect will be saved come what may, and the rest will be lost to do whatever they will. So what does it matter whether we preach the gospel or not? I hope you can see, folks, it is completely false to say the elect will be saved come what may. The elect won't be saved come what may. They'll only be saved come mercy. And how does mercy come? They'll be saved by the faithful prayers of God's people and the witnessing of God's people 
And that's why we may have a certain preach the gospel because that's how mercy comes. You know that verse goes. Paul says, faith comes by hearing. And how's hearing come? And hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear unless they're sent? It's the whole reason for Christian missions because we have a sovereign God who's predetermined in that. And don't be taken in by that wrong statement um, you know, that the, the others are lost do whatever they will because that implies that they might want to believe in the gospel but they can't because they're not elect. They've already dealt with that question. So these wrong ways of thinking feed back on themselves over and over again. I want to come to this last issue which is the question of personal interest. But this is where people are asking, I guess we've probably all been down this track sometime, has God chosen me? Okay, I've heard about this doctrine of election. I believe it. But I'd like to know now, has God chosen me? I'd like to know if I'm one of his elect. How can I find that out? It's personal interest, you see. Well, there's a couple of answers I'd like to leave with you. First of all, can I just say this, and this is pretty stark, but it's true. It actually is an invalid question. It's an invalid question for anyone who's not a Christian. Because what it's attempting to do, it's attempting to pry into God's secret will while at the same time ignoring his revealed will. It's asking, am I a Jacob or an Esau? God's never revealed that to you or me. One of Satan's favourite tricks is to try and have people worry about secrets while they ignore the open, revealed the of God. I've got, a, I've got a little book in my hand here that some of you may have read, because it's a fantastic illustration in this book. It's a book called The Welsh Revival of 1904. The good thing about the Welsh Revival is they're next door to Scotland. But in this book, this, this will touch you up. The Welsh Revival of 1904, one night, a godly old minister had preached the gospel. Oh, I'm going too fast here, just being with godly old man preached the gospel, and the people who were in his village were listening. He pleaded with them very, very honestly to humble themselves. He begged them to confess their sins. And he begged them to receive Christ's gracious offer of forgiveness for all who come to him in repentance. So when he finished the sermon, there was a time for comments. And one man stood up and he said, Preacher, I would believe the gospel at once if I knew I was one of the elect. Well, the minister asked him straight away, Sir, where did you find this word elect? And his answer was, I read it in the ninth chapter of Romans. And as quick as a flash, without any delay, the preacher said, then mind your own business. That letter is addressed to Christians. The correspondence that is addressed to you is called the gospel, and it commands you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved and do not delay. But you're still an old God's minister. He got it. I think a very astute minister and answered a faulty attitude. But now let me take you one step further. I'm really done, so hang in with the heat. I want you to be aware, folks, and you probably are, but this will impress you. The gospel we believe in. Is the gospel addressed to the elect? Does the gospel say, turn to me and be saved, all you elect? No, it doesn't, does it? It says, turn to me and be saved. For I am God, and there is no other. It's talking to the whole ends of the earth. In fact, turn to me and be saved, all your ends of the earth is the way it's put in Isaiah 45. Does the gospel say, come into me, come unto me, if you are elect, I'll give you rest? Does it say that? No. <coughs> it says, come unto me, all who are burdened and many burdened with sin, and I'll give you rest. Come whoever you are. <coughs> the scripture say, does the gospel say, God now commands all his elect people everywhere to repent? No, it does not say that, does it? Rather, God now commands, come on folks, be with me, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. The gospel is addressed to sinners 
not to those who think they might be or could be or perhaps are elect. I'm not going to do the the gospel, as far as the call of the gospel goes. And I think I just gave you those verses. Yep, that's the one. There's the three we just looked at. The only way you can know God and know if you are elect by God is by doing what elect people do. And what is it, folks, that the elect people do? If you're elected to follow Christ, what do you do? You follow Christ. Do you? do you want to know if you're a fisherman? What do fishermen do? They catch fish. Do you want to know if you're a fisherman? Go and catch some fish. Do you want to know if you are an artist? Then do what artists do. Go and paint pictures or do whatever the artist does. Do you want to know if you're a composer or an architect? Then go and do what they do. Go and write music or design buildings. Election is something you can only know about after you embrace Christ. After you embrace Christ. You notice what Peter, how Peter puts it? He says, Therefore, my brothers, and by the way, he said brothers, he means Christians, my like Christian friends, believers, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and the election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never fall. You want to be sure you're elect? Make your calling and election sure by doing these things. What things? Well, thankfully, Peter lists them. He doesn't we have to guess what they are. What are these things that prove our election? Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, knowledge, and to goodness add knowledge, and to knowledge add self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance add godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness add love. Then you'll know you're elect. There's no natural man to do that. Only God's chosen to do that. So if you want to know if you're a Jacob rather than an Esau in the sense of the chosen or the not chosen, do these things. Well, it wasn't quite a hot day like it is now. We'll probably go for another five minutes, but I think I reckon I'm nearly spent. You folks have been incredibly strong to sit here with me. I just hope, my last comment would be, I hope that just thinking a bit this morning about these answers to the questions that have been raised through our history on the election, I'm hoping that they've struck a chord with you. May God open many minds to see the sublime glory of his, his plan of salvation. And may we all live such godly lives that we can, as Peter puts it, make our calling and election sure soon. Thanks for being so patient, friends, and hanging in there.